Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Millionaire in the Making series. This is episode nine. I've been showing you full budget walkthroughs every single week featuring real numbers from real people. And I've shown you just how powerful planning can be because that's all a budget is, it's a plan. There'll be 10 episodes in this round. So after today's, we have just one budget left. Today, I'm budgeting for a 35 year old single mom in Jacksonville, Florida. She is a senior HR manager earning $120,000 a year. She finds herself going into the red every single paycheck and she cannot wrap her head around why. So let's look at the numbers to see just what's going on here and how we can break the cycle. We'll create a roadmap for her to pay off $15,000 of high interest debt in just nine months and 6X her investing dollars thereafter. Let's do it. So just as we've done in the past, let's see where things stand for her debts, savings, and investing. We wanna start there. Here is a snapshot of her debts. So we have about 4,000 in credit card debt. We've got a personal loan that has a pretty steep monthly minimum payment. Right, we've got an 11% interest rate there, which I would consider that high interest. The car loan is actually almost gone. So there's just a few payments left there on the car loan and then a good bit of student loans with interest rates that range from three to 6%. So in total, we're looking at about 89,000 in debt and she's paying 1,668 per month in minimum payments. So here's what we need to pull away from this debt snapshot. Because credit card debt is involved, we are going to be making additional payments to crush this as fast as possible. And I mentioned I would still consider this 11% high interest. So I'm also looking at paying this personal loan off ahead of schedule too. I would love to see this 839 every month go elsewhere, go towards her financial goals rather than her past. So these are the two line items that I'm really pulling away from this debt snapshot. We then shift over to her master bill list. This is where we're going to list those bills that she covers every single month. We're also going to make sure that we mark which of these line items is a need, meaning it's a core expense, non-negotiable, has to be paid every single month. So those are gonna be housing, food, transportation, minimum debt payments. You'll see here, I put an asterisk with the car loan minimum payment. I didn't mark that as a need because there are just a few payments left on that car loan. So when she's calculating her emergency fund and setting her goals, she doesn't need to factor this in. So that is why I did not mark that one as a need but we've captured everything there on the left in terms of monthly bills with that fixed due date. She does tithe every Sunday. So on average about 40 per month in, in tithes. We also wanna make sure we capture variable spending. So we've got food, fuel, and then meals that she covers for her child. We use this master bill list. We do a little bit of math and we figure out, okay, what is one month of necessary expenses. What is that total? And that is this 5,258 in her case. Typically what we would jump to next is filling in right here her emergency fund current balance. But I jotted it down right here and you'll see why in just a moment. But this is all of her savings and she does have it labeled as emergency fund. But this is what we're dealing with, this 3,682. Before I go any further, I'm already, my wheels are already turning thinking about her debt snapshot and how a plan that we at least want to consider is taking some of that savings and going ahead and paying it towards some of the high interest debt. So that's why I didn't just put it here and then move on. What we can go ahead and do though, is list in here her starter goal, which would be one month of expenses saved. That's that exact same figure that we wrote up here. If we want, we could round that to an even 5,300. So when we consider her situation, she's renting right now. She has a child. She's got, you know, steady income. I think a four month emergency fund would be good here. So if we take about 5,300 and multiply that by four, we're looking at $21,200. That would be her full healthy emergency fund goal. And it represents four months of core expenses saved. Now, if you've been with me for a while, you know the next thing I'm gonna say, which is we need to set up more savings buckets. It is totally okay and very common to have five, 10, a dozen savings buckets because a lot of us are saving for multiple things at the same time. And there are savings buckets that are applicable year round. 
So let's move over a page to the first savings bucket tracker spread. We can put four buckets here and then we can fit four buckets on the next two page spread. Emergency fund is there by default, but I wanna make sure, normally I would put home maintenance if she were a homeowner, that's the first thing I would put here, but that's not the case, she's renting, but I do wanna make sure that we put car maintenance, that needs to become a bucket. Now in her questionnaire, she mentioned a couple more things that I think are excellent fits to become savings buckets. One of them is youth sports costs. So clearly her child is involved in sports and there are tournaments. So traveling to those tournaments, hotel stays, gear, like costs really add up with that. And so she mentioned there is a line item right now that's applicable which is $692 for that youth sports line. So we're gonna make sure that we have that right away. We need to have that set aside right away. It also looks like there are about $200 per month needing to go to co-pays and prescriptions. So if we know that these costs are you know, recurring, typically we would put them here on the master bill list. You would just make it a consistent budget line. We have a medical line here and then youth sports. But these are costs that fluctuate so what we don't wanna do is create the line item and then maybe we go two, three months where we don't need those funds. We get in the habit of having that extra spending money and then, oh, now here comes three months where we do need those. In fact, we need more than we did before. So rather than list it here, because of its inconsistencies, we're gonna go with buckets for those. Youth sports and medical. And I mentioned right now, there's 692 that we're needing for youth sports and then about 200 for medical per month. But again, I would imagine that this fluctuates. So it's better to just build this up as a bucket and have those funds when you need them. I'll turn the page and go ahead and list holidays here as well because those are upon us and we want to make sure that she doesn't need to turn to her credit card to cover holiday costs. So we've listed these buckets now. My goal here is to take that 3,682 that she currently has in savings and reallocate it across these buckets, in particular those ones that have an immediate need. And then we wanna maintain an emergency fund, of course, so we're not gonna completely wipe that out, but we've got buckets to nurture, part of the emergency fund to keep in place. And ideally there's a good amount that we can put immediately towards her credit card debt so that we can really make a dent with the credit card debt. So here is how I would reallocate that 3,682. So for the emergency fund, can draw that down to 1,500. The immediate costs that she has, 692 was the amount she gave me for youth sports. Medical, if we can put 400 to the side for this into that medical bucket, she should be squared away based on her averages for November and December just right away, okay? Because remember, she has this savings. We're just getting more organized and separating this 3,682 by goal. Holidays, we could even do 500 there. We would still have $590 that could go towards her credit card debt. This is multitasking your money if I have ever seen it, okay? We're taking this 3,700, we are spreading it across these buckets and still there's about 600 left that we can immediately put towards that credit card. We're gonna to touch on one more aspect of her finances, which is her investing, and then we will move to her budget worksheets. So she's currently contributing 300 per paycheck, or that would be 600 per month because she's paid semi-monthly, right? So two times per month, always on the 1st and the 16th. So 600 a month going into her 401k, and the current balance of that account is about $65,000. And this is her only investment account. And let's keep in mind she's 35, Given her debt situation, the 4,000 in credit card debt and that personal loan at 11%, what she could do is draw this number down. Okay, so go into her pay portal and instead of doing 300 per check, just invest up to the match, just up to the match. I don't know what that exact math is, but we are going to change it to where it's 120 per paycheck rather than 300. And this would be 240 per month. So dialing back her 401k contribution so that she has more that she can put towards the debt. It behooves her to pay more attention to the debt and paying that down versus investing. 
The credit card sets her back 27%. The stock market might bring her forward 8 to 10%. She's not going to be able to out-earn this debt by investing. So that is why I would consider this scenario. If we were to put these figures into a retirement calculator, investing 240 a month, we've got a current balance of 65,000, we factor in inflation. This is just simply not aggressive enough investing to retire comfortably even in her 60s. These are the kind of numbers that pull her into her 70s before she could retire. Now that's not counting social security. It just assumes that she stays at 240 per month. Now you're gonna see here in a moment as we draft her budgets that we're gonna be able to go well above this 240 per month and get her on track to comfortably retire in her 60s, maybe even her 50s. She mentioned how she's always going into the red and she cannot wrap her head around it. I wanna show you an example budget for October 1st through the 15th. She mentioned how she's always paid on the 1st and the 16th. So here would be her budget window for her first budget in October. This paycheck here in the income block is calculated with the 120 going towards her 401k, not the 300. So this would be that updated paycheck amount. The first block, we list all of her expenses that have a due date that fall between the 1st and the 15th. We've captured her variable spending for about a two week period. Here's what happens. When we add all these expenses up, we end up with $3,948. If we take her paycheck and subtract this, we go into the red. We go to negative 82. So that explains what's going on in the first half of the month. Her income does not cover all of her bills that fall in that window. The first half of the month tends to be pretty heavy bill-wise because that's when most of us pay our rent or our mortgage. But here's a move she could make that would help her get into the green for the first half of the month. If she were to log into her account for her auto insurance, if she's able, we could move this from a due date of the 9th to a due date that falls in the second budget, something like the 17th or 18th. If she's able to do that, in the first half of the month, her paycheck would cover all the bills and she could even include a cushion here of $189. That's if this line item were to disappear from this first budget in the month. Now, of course, that's not ideal, only being able to cover your bills when you get paid. She can't even go into any of these other sections of the budget, but it's a quick move she could make that would put her into the green for the first half of the month. So this is just me demonstrating how things are going into the red. If we look at November 1st through the 15th, here's that same paycheck amount here in the income block. Also in the income block, I'm gonna include that savings transfer of 590. What this represents is this, we repurposed her 3,700 in savings and we wanna put 590 towards a credit card. I wanna actually see that extra debt payment in the budget. We show it as a savings transfer here in the income block. We add those two together to give our total income. Here are all of her bills. Notice the auto insurance is not here. We're assuming that that is now a bill that's covered in the second half of the month. We have all of her variable spending. We have a cushion of 189. And I mentioned how in a typical month that would be breaking even for her. That would be all of her 3866 paycheck, but she's gonna have 590 left this time because we transferred another 590 in. And here is where that 590 is going. It's an extra credit card payment. So it goes in block three, extra debt payments. And at that point we have given every dollar a job. So this would be a great start here for the first half of November. For the second half of November, okay, same paycheck here, very consistent. Now I've got this auto insurance line with a due date of the 17th. We've got some other subscriptions and minimum debt payments captured here. We have our variable spending and we have a cushion listed, so that's great. Now I didn't do my calculations, here's why. We both saw that the first half of the month is extremely tight. If she moves that auto insurance bill, it allows her to budget a cushion, but this is the whole budget for her the first half of the month. We need to have more funds to work with the first half of the month. The way that we do that is through a rollover. And what's gonna end up happening is, this is us telling the budget, hey, don't touch this 500, this is what it's for. That 500 then rolls over into the first half of December. And it becomes funds that she can work with in this budget to be able to get past the expenses block and have more wiggle room 
in the first half of every month. So this is going to be her new pattern. The second half of every month, we're budgeting a rollover. And it's going to help us even out the two budgets every single month. All these added up, we get $27.89. So that leaves us with $1,077 to work with. And we advance to block two, which is the emergency fund. When we reallocated her savings, we made sure that her emergency fund stayed in place and we had a bit of funds there. So it's at 1500, but we really got our eyes on this high interest debt. So in this case, I'm going to say, let's go into block three. Let's do an extra credit card payment of $500 and that will leave us 577. I don't want to put all of this 1077 into the emergency fund or towards the credit card. I don't want to do all of it because I'm keeping in mind that the reason people typically turn to credit cards is they don't have the savings in place for costs that keep coming up. So here's what we'll do. 500 as an extra payment on the credit card. We're not going to press on the gas with investing, but we are going to make our first contribution to that car maintenance bucket. She, in her questionnaire, she said, hey, maintenance costs keep popping up. This should be a bucket for all of us who have a vehicle because those costs are coming. I'm also gonna put the first contribution here for youth sports. There's a tournament in the very near future and that's what the 692 is. She's got that right now today. So she's able to cover those travel costs, but we need to keep saving because her child's gonna continue playing sports. Those costs are gonna keep coming up. So let's make sure we're nourishing that bucket as well. 77 left to work with. We're not going to invest in a 529, okay? We're not gonna do anything here in block six. And let's assume that in this time window here, we don't have some activity that she wants to do with her child or some sort of household project that she's working on. So what we can do is put that 77 aside for her, for personal spending. And that could go towards beauty costs, hobbies, whatever she'd like. And because she also mentioned that she goes into the red with this budget as well, that does happen to have a lot more discretionary income to work with, I would encourage her to track her spending every single day. Really look at the numbers and see where does our money typically go. These budgets are built for her. She can use them just as they appear here. But part of upholding the budget is tracking your spending, recording the date, what the expense was, giving it a category, and then just tracking your running account balances, that is crucial because that's gonna help her gain awareness of where her money is going. We need to track spending so that we can actually uphold the budget and see our progress along the way. She may find that perhaps these amounts aren't high enough or there are bills that she forgot about, but I think more likely it's the fact that she's had car maintenance costs that have popped up that she wasn't ready for. Again, that's why I'm emphasizing, let's start that bucket. And when it comes to youth sports, it could be that tournaments are being announced and she's not getting a lot of time to financially prepare, right? It's based on how the team performs. So it's important that we grow savings. As we look now into December, we have her paycheck. We have that rollover from the end of November that comes through. Here are her expenses that are covered between the 1st and the 15th. Her variable spending is captured here. We have a cushion. So 3837 would be the total of all these expenses, meaning we have 529 left to work with. And here's what I would do in this case. Again, I'm really aggressive on that credit card. So an extra payment here of 450, and that would leave 79. I would put that remaining 79 into the youth sports savings bucket. So really just being hyper attentive to let's pay the debt down and let's make sure we have savings for costs that are consistently coming up. So that would be the first half of December. Second half of December, we have her paycheck, the bills that are going to be covered between the 16th and 31st, variable spending, a cushion, and again, here's that rollover. This line is going to be applicable to every second half of the month budget moving forward. We have 1077 left to work with. Let's put an extra 500 on that credit card, nourish these two buckets again, and then that 77, let's say she ends up wanting to do something with her child for New Year's. Maybe she invites friends over, has a small shindig. We can put the remaining funds towards that. And this being at zero tells me we have given every dollar a job. 
So by year end, if she's able to stick to these budgets, she will have built her car maintenance savings bucket up to $600 and youth sports up to $479. And in terms of the credit card, she will have paid this $590 from her original savings as an extra payment. And then the other three budgets that I built for her, another $1450 would have gone towards the card. So altogether, $2,040 in extra credit card payments. So we've managed to slash that thing in half in November and December. While still making sure that she's got 1500 set aside for emergencies, she was able to have a pretty nice holiday season and she's built up some savings. I would say this is a solid plan for November and December. The last thing I wanna show you is the debt payoff plan for the credit card, cause we're not quite done with it, and that high interest personal loan. And as the debts fall off, provide some ideas for where those funds can be redirected that formerly were debt payments. So let's first look at the credit card. I'll first list out the minimum payments. In terms of extra payments though, 1090 there in November, 950 in December. So those were the four budgets that you saw me put together. And then assuming we can keep that pattern up, an extra 950 would go towards a credit card in January and another 950 in February. And it's at this point that the card would be paid off. With this 164, starting in March, she doesn't need to put that 164 towards a credit card. She can put it somewhere else. And I would recommend that she put that towards savings buckets. So she'll want to look at the numbers and look at her spin tracking up until that point to see which savings buckets need this 164 the most. But that's what I would do with that 164. I'm going to come back to this 950. Let's look at the personal loan. For this one, it's an 839 minimum payment. So I've written that across the board. But here's the thing, if starting in March, this 950 then becomes additional payments on the personal loan and she keeps that up through July, it is at that point that the personal loan would be paid off. So we see the payoff plan for the credit card up here. This is what the personal loan payoff would look like. Finally, let's look at the car loan. The minimum payment is 401. We just need three more payments on that car and it's paid off. So I would take this 401 and starting in February, Go ahead and push that to the emergency fund, working towards that starter goal of one month of expenses saved. So this 164 minimum payment goes to savings bucket starting in March. This 401, what was a car payment, going to the emergency fund starting in February. This 950 got shifted over to becoming the extra payment for the personal loan. That continues through the summer of 2025, but then these funds have opened up. So that's $1,789 a month that can now go towards financial goals. So she could do a breakdown like 500 going towards savings buckets and 1289 being invested. So this would look like Roth IRA contributions and then boosting her 401k contributions up a little bit too. And if she's able to keep this up, assuming 8% average annual return before retirement, 5% during, 3% average inflation, and assuming that she needs about 5,300 per month in today's dollars during her retirement years, this gets her retiring when she's 64 and having enough to last until she's 85. And of course, if she's able to go above and beyond this, it's only gonna keep shifting that timeline to the left where we can start looking at her retiring maybe in her 50s. I know some folks find the retirement projections silly and not worthwhile because so much is going to change between now and then. But I think it's a great exercise to keep us motivated and it reminds us of the power of aggressive investing. So very excited for her. 2025 is her year. All right, that covers it for today's walkthrough. I hope you enjoyed it and found it helpful. Join me next week for the final episode of Millionaire in the Making. I'll be kicking off something I'm very excited about following this series. So be sure to subscribe and tap the bell so you get notified when new content drops. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.